everyone, welcome to Lingcourt. I'm Amy Rotondo. Welcome to my, my hood here. Um, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. And I want to start out by thanking the Reading League, specifically Dr. Maria Murray, Dr. Heidi Bevering Curry, and our resident Howard Wallowitz of the group Kelly Johnson, who um, have given me this terrifying opportunity. So thank you. <laughs> um, I also want to thank the Lincourt staff who came out tonight, Lincourt. Um, to listen to me drone on about data without being contractually obligated to do so. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate that. In Liverpool, my home district, thank you Liverpool for coming. Okay, so let's get started. When Dr. Murray and Dr. Bevering Curry asked me to present to you my data journey here at Lincourt, I said, why? No one really wants to hear me talk about data. But they said, um, you, you, they do trust us and you have to start at the beginning. You have to tell your whole story. So with their reassurance, um, here we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is our agenda for tonight. I'm going to um, give you an introduction about me because they told me to. <laughs> and not because I want to. And we're going to talk about Lincourt's data evolution, uh, working with different levels of data, proficiency versus growth, and then some great realistic strategies for educators who are super busy, and then some time for questions and answers. Does anyone want to leave right now? I know it sounds really exciting. Um, but you're here, so that's great. So first off, we're going to talk about my data. Um, how did my journey start? So data is a story to me. Now, I want you to bear with me, because about five minutes into this, you're going to wonder where am I going and what does this happen to do with data. Um, give me 10 more minutes and it'll start to make a little bit of sense. And then 15 minutes in, you should kind of start to connect the dots. So just hang in there with me. Um, but first off, I have a disclaimer, my first of several tonight. I have no credentials, OK? Um, unlike every other Reading League presenter you've ever heard, I do not have a PhD. I'm not a professor or even an adjunct. I've never authored a book or published an article. I'm not on any board of directors. No one cites me in their research. I've never given a commencement speech. I don't have my own website. I don't have any clerical staff. Um, I don't have an administrative assistant. And I literally have no discernible talent. I am not kidding you. Um, so what do I have? Well, I have experience. I have a lot of that, personal and professional. So we're going to start at the beginning, literally. How did I come to this position at Lincourt? So here is my story. So I grew up in the city of Syracuse. I attended Syracuse City Schools. Um, that's right, Henniger. Um, I was very poor. I grew up a child of divorced parents, and I had a wonderful, struggling single mother who put herself through school, went back to school to make a better life for us. Um, I was a free lunch kid. For a time in my childhood, I was homeless. And if you know anything about ACES scores, um, mine would have been between an 8 and a 10 at any given time during elementary school. So I started out as a, a struggling reader in first grade. I was that kid who was in that lower group over in the corner. Um, but somehow, through the power of Syracuse City old school DISTAR and SRA, I learned how to read. And this is my second grade report card that proves that. Um, I didn't do well in handwriting, but I did really well in reading. 
And um, by third grade, I was excelling in reading. And somehow, reading became my escape. Uh, I would walk to the Payne Branch Library every Saturday in Eastwood, and I would sit there for hours and I would check out the maximum number of books, and they would all be read by the next Saturday. Um, so I really understand, not just sympathize with students who come from poverty. Yeah. <laughs> I did not come very far at all. Yeah. I'm still a dork. That's for sure. Okay. Don't worry, yours is coming. So, um, where does that poor Henniger High School graduate go to college? Syracuse University, of course. So I went to SU, enrolled in their inclusive elementary and special education program where I met this really awesomely crazy girl named Heidi. And she was the complete opposite of me. And I loved her. I was fascinated by her. She came to class with her black Doc Martens and one time her snake literally wrapped around her and I was like, oh. I just loved her from the beginning. Um, so that's where I met her, and we graduated together with the same GPA, okay? <laughs> same GPA. I know she's brilliant, but back then she was, she was just Heidi. So um, <laughs> without the doctor. Tell more stories. Oh, I've got stories. Um, oh, for enough. So my parents like to say I never do anything the easy way, and that is very true. Because within 90 days, I graduated from SU. I married my college sweetheart, Tom Rotondo. And he had moved to North Carolina to teach physical education and coach football, and I followed him. And um, I didn't know what I was getting into, but I loved him, and so I did. And so I was hired by the Rocky Mount Nash County School District right off I-95 in North Carolina, the largest producer of gold leaf tobacco in the world. That's their claim to fame, I'm not kidding. Um, I was hired to teach self-contained special education first through fifth grade, because that's legal. In a trailer behind the school, in the middle of a cotton and a tobacco field, and all day long, the pesticide planes flew back and forth <laughs> over my trailer. Um, but I, hey, I had just graduated from SU, and I knew everything, okay? So it didn't matter. I was all good. I was gonna fix that, that Yankee. I was going down there, and they still to this day think I'm from New York City. That's another story. But I was full of confidence and ambition, and you know, even when they told me my materials would be what the other teachers threw away the first week of school, I did not give up. I knew what I was doing, I was gonna make a difference. But then um, reality hit, and it was really humbling because I realized maybe I didn't know everything about the world in special education. Um, even though I felt like I had kind of landed on Mars. When I had to um, get my IEP signed by my parents, um, they didn't have any transportation. So I would drive out to literally the middle of nowhere and drive down you know, this dirt road to oftentimes a cabin without indoor plumbing. And I would have to get my parents to, you know, to sign off and I would kind of go through the services for their child. And some of my parents couldn't sign their name. And the only um, occupation or job they could get was picking tobacco seasonally. And some of my parents had stopped school and literally before middle school. 
the end of elementary school. And it was really humbling for me because I thought I had grown up really poor in the city of Syracuse, um, but I didn't really know what poverty was. And it really opened up my eyes to illiteracy and the death sentence it really could be. Um, and, and I felt really fortunate to be a reader at that point because it really, I totally knew it was my ticket out of poverty, being a strong reader. Um, but then, Tom Rotondo decided that he was gonna coach football at Mount Vernon High School in Alexandria, Virginia. And so I followed him, again, up I-95 to Fairfax County. And I got a job teaching special education but, you know, this time I had more experience and a little more confidence, and so I was hired to open up this brand new state-of-the-art, multi-gazillion dollar building um, called Fort Belvoir Elementary, and it was gorgeous. It was the most beautiful school I'd ever seen, and within 90 days, I was in a trailer in the back of the building <laughs> teaching special education, but this time I was connected to the music trailer, which is really great for teaching students with special needs and attention issues all day long. It was awful. Um, but Tom was happy because he was coaching football, so. Um, but the best thing about Fairfax County is that it's in the top 10 largest school districts in the country and they have their own professional development catalog and so I took all kinds of classes um, all about assessment and testing and measurable outcomes and I really needed to know how to do that because I wrote 65 IEPs that year um, because I was on a military base and I had 50% turnover from September to June every year. So my caseload at any given point could have been 20 students or 45. And so I got really good at assessment and testing and writing measurable outcomes. Um, it was great. And then I thought, well, I really know everything now. I know everything. I'm, I'm doing really good. Um, but Northern Virginia, it was kind of hectic. and. Um, Tom Rotundo was getting a little homesick for upstate New York. Um, so he decided to go coach football in the Finger Lakes now, and I got a job at Brockport in Monroe County, because that's where he put me. And he taught PE, and I got this great job, and I actually got to teach in a building this time. It was great. So I taught at Fred Hill Elementary, on the campus of Brockport Central School District and it was great. And I walked into my orientation thinking I knew so much because I came from Fairfax County and they put me in this class on Linda Mood teaching, Linda Mood. And I thought, I don't know what this is. And I, I went through like two intense days of, of classes and, and I thought, I don't know what they're talking about. I didn't learn this at SU. Um, maybe I don't know everything there is to know about special education and reading. And so um, I, I tried to do the program the best I could without much knowledge, but some good training. And, you know, after a little bit of, of doing that, I said to Tom Rotundo, my East Coast tour is over. I'm going to go home. You can come if you want. I'm gonna go get my master's in literacy at Oswego because I need to know more about reading because I don't think I know everything there is. And I'm just gonna go back to Syracuse now. Um, and so he did, he followed me and, and he got a job in Syracuse City. See, we came full circle, right? Um, and he got a job teaching phys ed and I got a job here at Lincourt teaching fourth grade. And I got my master's in literacy and it was great um, because now I really knew everything. Um, I got my master's and I learned that three queuing system 
and I had it down, and I had my guided reading groups, and my DRA, and I was set. Like, I knew everything. I could fix everything with my kids' reading issues now. I was feeling really good. So I've got all this great experience, right? And again, because I don't like to do anything the easy way, right? I'm teaching, and I had a baby girl, Isabella, and then I graduated from my, with my master's in literacy from Oswego. I did what I was supposed to do. Um, then I had twins four weeks after I graduated with my master's from Oswego. And then, like, literally three weeks after the twins were born, Tom finished his master's at Brockport. See, he was still driving out there to finish it up. Um, we moved to a bigger house, and I'm still teaching during all this time, right? No, I never do anything the easy way, ever. Um, and then this happened. And so, all of a sudden, here Tom and I are both teachers. We have all this great experience. He taught APE, you know, I taught special ed, and it meant nothing. Like, all of our experience, all of our education, um, working with kids with special needs every day, it, it meant nothing anymore. We knew nothing. Um, so we learned a whole new education called autism, and what goes into living your life in a completely different way with three children on the spectrum and at completely different places on the spectrum with completely different comorbid conditions and all kinds of complications. So again, because we don't do anything easy, um, a year after that, Tom went and got a second job, and I resigned from my tenure position here at Lincourt. But luckily, because Lincourt is so awesome, they said, don't leave. You can teach part-time special ed and reading. And so I did. And then um, I started a 13-month, five-day-a-week program at the Upstate Family Behavior Analysis Clinic with Dr. Henry Rome, who worked with my son, Nicholas. Um, that's Nicholas on the front page of the Syracuse Post Standard. See, they wanted to do an article on this new clinic that came to Upstate, and we were one of the first people up there. And I'm like, sure, you can interview us and take some pictures. And then the next Sunday, I got the paper, and there we were on the front page. And I didn't know we were going to be on the front page, but we were. Um, and so. Uh, what can you do then? There's your whole life splashed out in front of you. But it was good that we did it. Um, I learned a whole nother education at Upstate with Dr. Roan. I learned all about data collection and collecting data in a really valid, reliable way. I learned all about how, at the time at least, in education, we really didn't use data much. We just kind of used to go on our feelings a lot, and that really bugs researchers, can I just tell you? Because I would stand there in, behind that two-way glass every day and watch what they were doing, and, and I just learned how there's such a disconnect at the time, especially between research and education. And so I just soaked it all up. I soaked everything up that I could up there. Oh, and by the way, I then enrolled in my CAS program at Lemoyne because I wasn't really sleeping between midnight and 3 a.m. anyway. And I didn't have much going on. So I thought, well, why don't I do that too? You know, I'll just get my CAS and see where it leads. Never do anything the easy way. So this was my goal, okay? I was going to get my CAS, and armed with all of this new knowledge about autism and special education, 
I was going to make a difference in regional programs. Um, I got connected with all kinds of people and nonprofits. I went and visited all kinds of programs around New York. Um, but if you learn anything about my life at this point, it really didn't turn out that way. That is not where my journey took me. So hopefully at this point, you know, you think I'm somewhat qualified to talk to you about educational data tonight, but you might still be wondering, what does any of this have to do with your teaching and collecting data every day? So it will make sense soon, I promise. For me though, all these experiences kind of came together as I was finishing up my CAS and things got really bad with my son. Um, all these different experiences that I was going through, they were all for a reason. Everything, every year, every teaching position, everything that I felt was a setback, it, it just kept teaching me and it kept pushing me forward to keep learning, to keep growing, and that maybe I didn't know everything there was to know out there, um, but I was getting a whole lot of education along the way. So, this is where LINCOR comes into it. <laughs> this is how I live my professional life. Ask anyone here. Okay. So, guess what? They kept me on. Wasn't that nice of them? I finished my CES and they're like, look, all of this stuff is coming down the pike with RTI, whatever that is, and part 100 regs, and you seem to have a good handle on, you know, Excel, so <laughs> why don't you stick around and you can take care of this, right? So I met with Jay Austin, our wonderful superintendent, and he's like, okay, here you go. Go figure it out. So I did, and here were my initial responsibilities. I had to report district data to state and federal departments. I still do that. I wrote and had to implement the new RTI plan and part requirement, program requirements of the uh, 2010 Universal Screening System, the new mandates for K-8, reading and math benchmarks three times a year. Um, and then I had to analyze and present this data to teachers and administrative staff for the purpose of impacting and targeting Tier 1 instruction first, but then implement and supervise a Tier 2 and 3 progress monitoring system for the purpose of implementing research-based academic and behavioral interventions. And then I needed to work with the teaching staff on implementing data-driven instruction. So, you know, just a few things there. And so I dove into those Part 100 regulations, right? Only someone like me would enjoy that. Um, I learned all about information and reporting systems, the Office of Accountability. Sometimes they call me. You know, we talk about state testing and all kinds of fun stuff. But basically, the first order of business was developing this thing called the inquiry team. So there's a lot of different names for an inquiry team. Raise your hand if your school has one. It's a trick question you all do. <laughs> it's just called a lot of different nonsense, right? The data team, the building level data team, data inquiry team, school-based intervention, remember SVIT, right? Uh, the district data committee. I've even seen this one, this is no joke. District Data and School Accountability Committee. How scary does that sound, right? Isn't that awful? Okay, so I'm like, no, we're not going to have ESPA or any of that. We're going to have something really hokey. Um, so we came up with CARE Team, which stands for Child Assessment Response Evaluation Team. And it is a professional learning community, and I was super proud of it. Um, it is the best name ever. 
for a data inquiry team, and this is our purpose. Okay, so after I came up with CARE Team, I got busy with lots of fun things. Um, I read everything I could by the DeFores on creating a PLC culture, and I wrote the LinkCore RTI plan to meet new state mandates. I trained my new CARE Team on the Ames web system 1.0 back in the day. We implemented a district progress monitoring schedule for K-8. I scheduled all kinds of fun new care team meetings with grade levels to talk about all this fun stuff. Everyone was really excited. We're going to do lots of testing. And then I just was annoying everybody. Everyone was just super annoyed with all this data. No one was really into it like I was. Um, but they went along with it. Thank you, Lincourt. Everything was great. We were up and running, and I put together great binders. I was like binder queen. This is my binder outline. If you look at section two specifically, you'll see what we were using for assessment. Fun, so Dibbles, right, it's okay. DRA, Fontes and Pinnell, LLI, Harcourt, Lucy Calkins, writing, and some math, you know. <laughs> Something to do with math. Um, so now I had all the answers. Now I knew what I was doing. Up and running. I didn't have any clue. No clue. So I'm going to show you my cringeworthy beginning. And it's like confession time, okay? The, this is a presentation I gave to some of my initial care team meetings in the beginning, okay? Please, no judgment. Look at the heart. This is right before Valentine's Day. <laughs> okay. First, we went over new business, and I assigned roles, and no one followed them ever. <laughs> Do you ever have meetings with a timekeeper? Does anyone ever want to be the timekeeper? Rule enforcer. Oh my God. When I ask someone to be the rule enforcer, they like cringe. Like, no, I don't want to do that. And then we had a summarizer note taker who took notes, but, you know, not a whole lot happened, so it was okay. Um, so this is our business, and we're going to look at some district data, all right? Here's the summary. You ready? Comprehension scores very consistent. Great improvements in ORC. Strengths, vocabulary, and dolch words. <laughs> Challenges, hmm, everything else, right? <laughs> we had 93 non-responsive students in AIS. Hmm, that might be a problem, but I still had lots of celebrations, okay? So every grade level we celebrated. I was really trying. I was trying really hard. Um, so my first celebration was this teacher. She was pregnant and she made it to February. Because <laughs> that's what you talk about in a data meeting, right? Um, we had seven kids leave AIS reading. Okay, that's okay. They ended right back up in it a few weeks later. Well, that's, um, our DRA level increased. Super. And something with Study Island. We don't use that anymore, so I'm not really sure. Um, here's our first grade celebrations with our data. Sight word improvements. Very specific. 
They progress monitored every day. That's why they were champions. They worked so hard. I led them down so many bad paths. Two kids got out of AIS reading, and our DRA level, it went from two to four, y'all, okay? That was, I don't know what that means. Fourth grade, okay, this is literally, these were our celebrations. Specifically, celebrating comprehension. <laughs> Vocabulary. Oral reading fluency. Again, it's very specific, I know. DRA went from 36 to 40. Okay, and something again was study island. I don't remember. But guess what? Spoiler alert. What happened with our oral reading fluency in fourth grade from that February 2012 to June? Hmm. Any gains we made were gone. But I kept trying. It was the same with third grade. Now, in third grade, we welcome back a teacher from maternity leave. Welcome back. Here's your data. Um, it's not good. <laughs> um, kindergarten, they had great gains in sight words and letter ID. The exact things we don't do anymore, but that's another story, right? They also progress monitored their heart, though. Um, and then in fifth grade, we went from a DRA 30 to a 38, again. But we did a great item analysis on comprehension and hardcore. It was great. It was so good. And then it didn't matter that no one could read in fifth grade, right? But our comprehension was good. No. Why were we worried about that? Why were we focused on that? All the wrong things. I told you it was cringeworthy. Um, so then we would wrap it up. The teachers would have 15 minutes to talk. Um, and then we'd ask some questions. Um, and we'd leave and nothing got accomplished. Nothing, right? We had the celebration of nothing. And, and then we'd leave. And we had no plan. These were my data meetings, right? Super proud. I couldn't understand why um, things weren't changing. This is our data-driven instruction summary. It makes no sense. What should we be focusing on for progress monitoring? Oral reading fluency, dummy. But I didn't know that at the time. And I would always thank everyone for their hard work, even though everyone would kind of leave scratching their heads and kind of frustrated. So, I'm sorry. It's my formal apology to all the teachers at Lincourt that suffered through my early data meetings. So what was missing from my care team data meetings besides data? Um, a total lack of focus on tier one, evidence-based instruction. Valid assessments that accurately measured literacy. Some focus on oral reading fluency would have been nice. Um, use of assessments which were not specific to the skill gaps we needed to monitor. We had no historical data comparison of specific students and grade level data before and afters. And we never really got to talk about any actual strategies or useful data analysis with the next steps. So after a couple of years of this, my comfort level with Ames Web got a little better. And I started to actually look more specifically and strategically at the CVM. And I noticed it really was not good. I had to face facts. And I, I started to notice this flat line in oral reading fluency. And it, when I put all the pretty triangles together, it, it never changed. It was always the same. Maybe a little up and down here or there, but I could have picked any year, any benchmark, any grade level, and it was exactly the same. And then I got really nervous because I started looking at 
some cohort to cohort data. And despite all of my hearts and charts and, and pretty care team meeting presentations, our kids were not making progress. And, and worse than that, we were going backwards. Our oral reading fluency rates, our average proficiency was going down. It was decreasing year after year. And that was a really scary trend. But luckily, something happened. I was extremely frustrated and banging my head against the wall, looking at all kinds of research and getting nowhere. Um, I wanted a magic program to fix everything. If only we could find a magic program. And the program will fix all of our reading problems and then everything will be good. Um, but it was a dead end. So around this time, our Board of Education President, Dr. Larry Salamino, sent our administrative team a presentation from this organization called the Reading League. And I thought, well, that's, you know, cornier than care team. <laughs> but I thought, okay, you know, I'll take a look. And I literally sat down after a board meeting. It was like nine o'clock at night. And I went through one of their first presentations and I almost cried. I kid you not. I was at my kitchen counter till almost midnight, going through it over and over and over. And I, I remember emailing the administrative team in the middle of the night, this is it. This is exactly what I've been looking for. This is our answer. It was really like the heavens opened up. It was a beautiful moment. And then suddenly, it dawned on me, all of that experience I had, all of that training, had led me to this point where, again, I didn't know what I didn't know. And I was back in the learner seat again. But it was okay. It was okay, because I'd been there multiple times. And it was because of all my experiences because of all my setbacks, that I was 100% open. When you are willing to face uncomfortable and persistent realities about the academic performance of students in your school, you're probably ready to lead your staff in a different direction. Because I knew I didn't have the answers, I was completely ready. And our staff was really frustrated too. So our administrative team sat down with our wonderful reading league ladies, Dr. Murray, Dr. Beverly Curry, Kelly, no PhD like me, right? But wise beyond, you know, anything I had ever seen. They had a plan. They were just amazing. Um, and they said, Put aside the magic program, okay? We're not there yet. You have to be patient. We're gonna roll out a long range plan. And I was like biting my nails, but you don't know how desperate I am right now. You know, our data looks terrible. Um, I've been telling everyone to do everything the wrong way, and I'm a wreck. Um, they're gonna fire me. And they said, uh, just hold on, we're gonna be good. And so we spent a year and a half working with the Reading League before we even talked about a program. We did all kinds of professional development. All with like the Reading League, all of these people now that are just like so hard to get a hold of, right? They were here all the time. Dr. Kilpatrick just stopped by one day at one of our sessions, you know, and it was just like, they were all there, these experts. I, I was just like soaking it all in. Um, so now that we had some knowledge, I knew besides everything that needed to change with instruction, my whole world had to change too. My data meetings needed a complete retooling and actual data. Um, and so 
I needed to present data to teachers that represented past, present, district grade level, all the way down to the individual student, but I also wanted everyone to understand why. The why behind what we do and the what behind the data. I wanted them to have reading and data knowledge. Working with different levels of data, so here we go. Your opinion's the best, right? Only everyone agreed with it? Okay, so another disclaimer I have for you tonight. So, from here on in in the presentation, I'm going to assume your district uses valid, reliable assessments that accurately measure students' skills. If this is not the case, this information may be helpful, but not immediately applicable. Quality formative assessments are step one. I hereby do not endorse any specific assessment or benchmarking system. New York State 3 assessments will not be part of this presentation tonight. I also recognize students are humans and there are many factors which can influence student performance day to day, thereby impacting data results. Thank you. Okay, so I've heard all of these things. This data doesn't mean anything because, right? My class had a bad day that day. The students were tested on a Monday. The students were tested on a Friday. The assessments were given in the morning. The assessments were given in the <laughs> afternoon. My students are bad test takers. My students have test anxiety. My students can't show what they know on a test. My students have bad home lives. My students are poor. These assessments don't mean anything. I can tell how my students are doing, right? We've all thought it. And a lot of those things could be true, and a lot of those things do influence student performance. But if we as educators have such little control over our students' performance, why are we doing what we're doing? And some of those things were true for me, and what if my teacher had said the same thing? That's what I always think about. So that's why care team data meeting rules say we can only focus on the things within our control. See care team golden rules appendix two. So ask yourself now, where are you on the data use continuum? Where would you put yourself or your team or your school, or your district. It's really fun to stay in data-informed world for a while, but then you gotta come out of it eventually. Okay, so let's talk about working with district and building data. This is what I call the big picture. So let's say you decide to take a road trip to Miami. Do you just jump in the car and go? Probably not. The first thing you might want to do is look at the overall distance for the entire trip. You take a bird's eye view of the driving as a whole. You look at the major routes first. You see some areas that are construction zones or red flags. And Google will just take you around those now, but just stick with me. So you take note of those and you see some good open areas where you can make some good time. And so why is this important? Why does everyone need to know district level data? Because historical district data tells teachers and administrators how your tier one literacy program and initiatives are working or not. It creates buy-in, it gives everyone ownership and shared responsibility. Instead of seeing data as dreaded accountability, it can empower staff, it can focus everyone on the same goals. And oral reading fluency is especially important to monitor and analyze. And this is how I knew Lincourt needed the reading link. And why is it important to me that um, everyone understand 
district level data because when it's not going well, it's, it's easy to justify the need for change. So because everyone had seen this, everyone knew we were going backwards, there wasn't a real strong argument about why we needed the reading link, why we needed to change our instruction. If we didn't have this clear picture, people would have questioned, well, why do we need to change? What's wrong? What's so bad about Fontes and Pinnell or LLI? It's working for us. But see, we knew it wasn't. So that's why I don't agree with the premise that teachers don't need to know what's happening in other classrooms, in other grade levels, in other buildings in a district. Teachers should be informed about everything happening in their district. So that when this happens, Right? When change does start to come along, when initiatives do start to work, it's incredibly meaningful. So this was our fourth grade reading composite performance last year after some transformative change. Had we not seen where we had come from, would we have known? Would we have known that we fall back every single time, every single benchmark. Um, what about viewing data cohort to cohort, following the same students year by year, building by building? Well, we started doing this. In winter 2016, we had just started working with the reading link. And for oral reading fluency, our second to sixth graders, because we didn't really even use the CBM for first grade, to be honest with you, because our kids couldn't even get on the board. So we started it in second grade. 43% um, of the students we tested were proficient. We just started bringing in the Reading League to do some good PD and build our knowledge. After a year, you can see we went up to 45% proficient, and you might say, well, hmm, that's not so great. But we were turning around the Titanic. We had been going down every single year. So not only did we stop that trend, we turned it around and started improving. And that was just with building knowledge, doing some good evidence-based tier two and three intervention. Then winter 2018, we had just started implementing a new evidence-based tier one literacy program, UPK-5, and we went up a little bit more. Still working with the Reading League, still building our knowledge. And now this past winter, a year and a half of our new program, three and a half years working with the Reading League, we're at 60% proficient. So 17% more of our students are proficient in oral reading. Our fourth grade has the highest reading proficiency level in our data records at 73%. So that's huge for us. But that's not always enough for me. That's what I always say in my data meetings. I have to drill down further. I need to know more. So then what I did is I just looked at the last two years in our two-year cohort data from winter 2017 to winter 2019. Now I included first grade because, hey, we can use oral reading fluency in first grade now. And cohort to cohort, the same students, 22% more of them are reading proficiently in between first and sixth grade from 2017 to just recently. Um, but without looking at cohort to cohort district data, would we truly know the impact of the Reading League and our Tier 1 literacy program? 
would we really know the power of our evidence-based instruction? So three times a year, I publish this. This is our district benchmark data report. This is in Google Drive for all staff. So no matter what you teach, you can go into the drive three times a year and see how we did on all of our benchmarks, K-8. And I also present this to the Board of Ed three times a year, and so it is public information. Because data is really reinforcing when you use it right, and it can be really scary, but you know, you propel yourself to get past that fear to really digging down on how to solve the problem. And that's what the Reading League did for us. So now, level two, drilling down a little bit more, working with grade level data, root by root. So you're back on your road trip to Miami, and now that you have your major routes mapped out, you can start looking at specific areas of your trip, in your directions when and where you change routes. In which states do you have construction or bad weather? Where's a good place to stop? So now your directions are a little more specific, and you have a little bit more information for planning. Okay, so grade level classroom data. Benchmarks are obviously important, but they're just the tip of the iceberg. They're just the data jumping off point. So at our data meetings, we go from this, which is an overall composite score in Ames Web Plus, our Christmas trees as we call them, and then we drill down to this. So we pull out oral reading fluency data. And if your benchmarking system that your district or school uses does not use oral reading fluency as a measure, and I mean one-on-one -on -one sitting down with a student, not the student on a computer, then their, your benchmarks are really missing something because this is the most important thing. The most important thing for us is oral reading fluency. It tells exactly what direction to go in. Um, but Ames Web Plus isn't going to pull it out for you like we want, so we pull it out ourselves. We compare fall to winter and progress monitoring along the way. We look it at um, national norms and rates of improvement. We know which students are making half a year of growth by winter, which students have made a full year of growth by winter and are actually closing gaps in oral reading fluency, and then which students are not at all. And we color code it because luckily I work in a building with a lot of OCD teachers like me, and they like color coding too. So it's really helpful to see it this way though, in all seriousness. And then we look at oral reading fluency in relation to other assessments. So then we'll pull out a unit assessment and compare. So for example, this is second grade skills tracking from CKLA unit two. And we look at short vowels, long vowels, digraphs, blends, and vowel teams from that assessment as well. And put it all together so it's easier to compare. So by the way, at these data meetings where we look at all of this stuff, who needs this information? Who can benefit from having this data? Well, we share it across the board in our district. Besides just classroom teachers and reading teachers, we share all our data with our psychologists, speech therapists, special ed teachers are always at data meetings, um, ENL teachers. If you work with those students on literacy, you should be at the meeting. And if you can't make the meeting, you should at least have the data. Wouldn't it be nice if the counselor knew why a student might be struggling? This is my corny rowing picture that I show at a lot of meetings. 
Um, obviously, this system is going to work best when your district, building, grade level are all using the same assessments and programs and when you're all going in the same direction. When there's consistency, either building to building or grade level to grade level or even classroom to classroom. This system is really only going to work best when there is consistency. Okay, I gave you the disclaimer that I have no credentials and this isn't a research presentation but I am going to cite a little bit of research. Um, from the U.S. Department of Education, the white paper on using student achievement data to support instructional decision making. Five recommendations to help principals put student achievement data to best possible use. Make data part of the ongoing cycle of instructional improvement. Teach students to examine their own data and set learning goals. More on that later. Establish a clear vision for school-wide data use. Provide supports that foster a data-driven culture within the school and develop and maintain a district-wide data system. District-wide. Why have a district-wide system if the data isn't going to be shared with the district? Which means teachers. So one way we facilitate this and one way to facilitate it obviously in a larger school district would be um, something like Google Drive. So all of our Ames Web reports and data are put on the drive, never by individual teacher, just by grade level. So in our 1819 Ames Web folder, we have benchmarks and then additional information, progress monitoring manuals. Also, another disclaimer, I actually have on the drive a folder called Ames Web Archives. So anyone in our district can go into the archives and check and see if I, <laughs> my data is really true. All of our information is on there. So when you click on our winter benchmark folder, you can see that the reports are by grade level, kindergarten through eighth. And then next year we're gonna start just a little bit of UPK because UPK, UPK teachers asked. So I said sure. And then we have a folder called district reports so everyone can see our district data. Okay, so whittling it down now to classroom and individual student data, this is where we get into our turn by turn directions on our road trip here. So on the road to Miami, at some point near the end of your trip, you're going to have to get off the highway, take some smaller local roads, and this is where your directions will have to get more specific, where you'll be managing street by street directions at this point. So the same templates you can use for grade level data, you can filter by teacher, right? So it's important for teachers themselves, obviously, to look at their own students' data, but then within both contexts. So teaming with grade level colleagues to provide targeted instruction is something we try to do here as often as possible. So we filter our data first by grade level, but then we also look at classroom data, right? And so if you've got a few kids and that teacher has a few kids and another teacher has a few kids with similar challenges, it's much easier to collaborate because you have the same assessments and the same information in one place. We always grab our data. Um, then whittling down to students in tier two and three, this is um, how we graph QPS data for individual students. It's color coded. Actually, the skill sets are color coded by road to reading levels. That's how crazy we are here. Um, so we use a combination of assessments to diagnose the primary oral reading fluency and phonological awareness gaps for students who are struggling. We use the PAST and the QPS frequently 
and this drives a lot of our small group intensive instruction. Um, then for additional interventions, for example, rewards, we might use individual assessments and look at those across a classroom or grade level. So now I'm going to redeem myself. Let me show you how we do things now at Lincor the right way. So this was 2019, a few months ago in February. I got rid of the hearts. There is a snowflake. It's still who we are. But this is our agenda now. I'm going to take you through it. We have care team rules and norms. I got rid of the rules that we weren't following, but we read these at every single meeting. We have golden rules and meeting norms that we do our best to follow, like putting our cell phone aside, um, not attacking each other, but being really honest. I would rather that teachers come to a data meeting and air grievances and frustrations in the meeting to get them out so we can work on them together than to not say anything and leave the meeting and still be frustrated. And we try to stay on topic as much as possible. We read those every single time. And every single benchmark meeting, we go over all the assessments. I never assume everyone remembers them. I never assume that, um, you know, someone coming in new remembers all of them. Um, so I go through what students take each benchmark and then how it filters up through the grades. And what, again, Disclaimer, I don't advocate for any one particular benchmarking system. But what I do like about using Ames Web Plus is from first grade to eighth grade, we have a consistent assessment with oral reading fluency. So if a student stays here, we have nine years of oral reading fluency data. If anyone forgets anything about the assessments, we have a district guide, which I think is important to reference. Sometimes we forget, you know, what is that one test in winter that first grade takes on the test of early numeracy. So beyond all of that, I want all instructional staff to know all the benchmark assessments we give, K-8. I want them to see the progression of skills, and it's important to me that everyone has access to all of this information, regardless of their grade level or department. Because when people understand the assessments, they understand the data, and it suddenly has some value. And when people see their influence on the data, positive or negative, it becomes invaluable. So then we go through our building level data. Well, here, building is the same as district, right? Um, we go, go through score and skill plan reports, and we review exactly how our composite scores are calculated. We go through our tier transitions for reading and math and what it means to be included in that. And then I go through district-wide. How did we do? Fall to winter, winter to winter. So how did we do with the students we had since September? And then how did we do since last winter? And I'll do the same thing in spring. We have a lot of transiency here at Lincourt, a lot of students that come and go, and there's nothing we can do about that. But we know by looking at data in this way that the longer a student stays in our district, the better they do, the more their gap closes. We wouldn't know that if we didn't look at data in this way. Um, then, because I am a, you know, a total dork, I have to put it in a bar graph, but then I want to show exactly how we're doing, for better or worse. 
fall to winter and winter to winter. And again, I'll do the same thing in spring. Remember this slide. That was our district data summary just seven short years ago. Um, we also talk about the six types of reports for ELA and math, grade level, and individual student. And all of these are on the drive so teachers have access to them. And then, actually, we do get on to grade level data and work time. And it's not 10 or 15 minutes. It's hopefully the bulk of the meeting. And this is where we start to filter through all of this great data and look at which students are closing gaps, which interventions are working, which interventions are not working for these students and what we can actually do about it. But we also look at tier one and what's coming up in our literacy program and what we might need to do to scaffold or model for students with that as well. And that's where during the meeting we can access reports at any time. And I always end with that. We're all working together towards the same goal. So again, who is at the meeting? Our benchmark meetings that we have three times a year. Reading intervention teachers, ENL teachers, special education teachers, and sometimes reading teacher assistants whenever possible. Sometimes our speech therapists, um, can, if they can come, they do. They're extremely knowledgeable people at the table. Don't forget about them. They're awesome, and they can help a lot too. And so we don't always get everything done that we want to in maybe a 90 minute benchmark meeting, but we always leave with a plan for moving forward. So the meeting is not the end, it's the jumping off point. For smaller grade level team meetings, during common plannings, and it's also the beginning of the plan for the next marking period. We plan specific interventions for the next groups, look at tier one classroom interventions, think about how students might perform in upcoming units, what scaffolds they might need, our ENL students, what they might need. And for spring meetings, it's also looking ahead to the next school year. So now, um, understanding and using proficiency and growth data. So one last thing before we get to specific strategies, because this is really important to me. So there's two sides to the data coin, we like to say around here, growth and proficiency. Growth, how the data changed from point A to point B. And proficiency, how the data compares to an ideal standard. So here's an example, okay? Because Dr. Beverly Curry told me I needed a real life example. So I came up with one. Okay, so you go to the doctor, and your doctor says your LDL bad cholesterol is at 161. You're in the high range, right? She wants you to follow these strategies for lowering your level. Stop eating fast foods. Avoid foods with trans fats. Increase fiber-rich foods. And so your cholesterol level is not proficient. You could also say you're not proficient with strategies to control your cholesterol. So you're at high risk and you need intervention. So over the next three months, you follow those strategies and you go back to the doctor and you find out now your LDL is borderline, okay? So you're down three points. So you're not where you need to be, but you're making progress. Should you continue with the same strategies? Maybe add in some new ones? So you decide to keep the original strategies, which were helping, but add in some more. And you start on an exercise plan and limit your sugar. So you're borderline, you're not proficient, but you're better. So you work really hard and one year later you go back to the doctor and your LDL is 129. 
let's say, fairly good range. So proficiency versus growth. You're not optimum. Your improvement is significant. You know the strategies worked, so you celebrate. That's what I would bet. Um, so now your cholesterol is proficient, right? So you're good. So are you finished with all those strategies? Do you just throw them all away? All your healthy new habits and ignore everything you learned? So it's similar with reading data. Once an at-risk reader starts to make progress and we start to see shrinking of that gap, we tend to back off or discontinue those interventions. However, in order for the progress to continue, we need to continue building on those specific strategies the student is progressing with and continue to monitor. Because if you start eliminating all of those strategies and not checking in with your doctor anymore, what can and often does happen? What happens when we say a kid is proficient, they're good, we stop working with them, stop monitoring them, and they can just go back to business as usual. That was our downfall time and time again at Lincor, especially when we first started working with the Reading League. And let's say a student was doing really well in road to reading and we thought we closed enough of a gap and we stuck them back in the classroom in hardcore. And what happened every single time? They fell right back to where they were. This roller coaster effect, though, it can still happen to us when we're not careful. And every once in a while, it does creep up with us, this vicious cycle. So which data is more important? The moral of the story is both. Looking at growth and proficiency in the context of each other is vital. The same data tells you different but related information. So we always look at both. Okay, so now I'm gonna vent for a minute, okay? So, state testing, right? What goes in the paper? What goes on Syracuse.com? Proficiency. How many ones, twos, threes, and fours are in the paper? And if you looked at Lincourt's, proficiency data in the paper, you would be like, oh my God, why is the Reading League having her talk about anything? Um, what's never in the Post Standard or on Syracuse.com is your state-issued growth score that every district and building gets out of 20. And what they never publish is that Lincor always has very close to a highly effective growth score that we're always at 16 or 17 out of 20. But all the public sees is those ones, twos, threes, and fours. And you can have a student who scores a three or a four, but has completely flatlined in their reading data. They're not making any growth, but they can get through the state tasks. That's the end of my soapbox moment. Okay, so finally, strategies for busy educators. What you came for, right? Okay, so good news. This is a perfect time for these strategies. So I'm really excited to share these with you. Um, so you're kind of busy, right? So who has time to work with data? Besides, obviously, student achievement. I promise you the time you spend organizing, reviewing, and meeting on student data will save you much more in the long run. I promise. So much more, tenfold. So strategy one, okay? And I don't know where everyone is on the data continuum or where your district is, but let's just start at the beginning, okay? Understanding your access to data and getting more. 
So if you don't feel like you have a lot of access to data in your district, find out who controls it. Is it someone in a cubicle somewhere at the DO that you've never seen before or know their name? Or maybe it's just you know an administrator in your building. Whoever it is, befriend them and bring them donuts because no one ever does. Find out how much access to data and reports you have. And most likely, you already have a system login that allows you to run all the reports you need, but maybe no one's ever told you. Um, just ask how. If you don't already, ask for help in understanding the system that your um, district benchmark system generates. Okay, strategy two, reflecting on this year. So as we get into spring testing mode, gather review data on your students' reading growth this year, even if it's just oral reading fluency. Compare fall to spring, September to June, what worked, what didn't. Look at students who made progress in their profiles. Look at students who you wanted to do better. Note their profiles. And remember this to compare to profiles of students you're getting in the fall. Well, how are you going to do that? Okay, data gathering now, data hoarding. Um, so I know no one really knows who they're getting next year, but you and your team can look at students coming up to your grade level maybe. Are they coming from another building? Can you get information from staff there before the year ends? Without a formal meeting, just see if reports can be emailed to you if they aren't shared in your district. And also, Remain friendly with data people because they can help with all that. This is something I do over the summer. For our staff, I make an assessment schedule for the year. This really helps, at least for the first marking period, if you can put together what assessments you'll have and kind of gauge when these assessments will happen. Look at tier one unit assessments students take. Think about progress monitoring, how it can impact instruction, how you can easily organize all this data generated. So it's useful for instruction, because that's the bottom line. Data is only as useful as you know, it helps drive your instruction. This is another thing I do. I'm actually working on them for next year. Creating data templates for next year's assessments now. So we have these templates on Google Drive. So any teacher in any grade level can put any information in at any time. Everyone has editing rights. You put your students in. I will put in the fall benchmark data for our staff. And then teachers can put in benchmark, or um, excuse me, formative assessments, summative assessments, placement tests in the beginning of the year, and then special education teachers, reading teachers, speech therapists, they can put in any notes or data they want to. For example, um, if you have a first grader with some significant articulation issues, it's really going to be helpful if your speech therapist is in on the data and can kind of help you with that. Okay, this is an ambitious one, I know. Data meeting schedule. So if you have your assessment schedule and you have some templates, you can figure out a data meeting schedule and look ahead at key times of the first marking period when it would be really helpful to be able to sit down with your team and who might need to be there. And if you don't have common planning times with these people, how and when can you meet? So, Maybe, and you didn't hear it from me, think about meeting with your building principal about release time and bring donuts to that meeting too. So we have release time here where we sit down with benchmark data and also at interim care team meetings in between to talk about how students are doing. And we do our best to get everyone to the table that can be there. Realistically, it's a challenge, but we do our best.
So once you have all this data, how are you going to know if your kids are getting better? What's the measurement? So if we're using Ames Web, we use national norms always. We never compare ourselves to ourselves. We don't even compare ourselves to OCM BOCES or the region. We only use national norms. And this is where that growth versus proficiency balance becomes super important. Where are your students in the beginning? What percentile band are they in? And where do you want them to be? Not just at the end of the year, but maybe mid-year. And progress monitoring in between. What's most important for us is monitoring the ORF and phonological awareness that comes first and we look at the norms tables and how much growth is needed to shrink the gap. Because again, a proficient student is not gonna stay proficient if they're not making sufficient growth. And a student who is struggling but making growth might not be making enough to close any gap. So how do you know how your students are doing? You need some sort of national standard to measure progress against. Okay, strategy eight. Educate and include students in the data process. So we have some really highly effective, successful teachers in our district. Um, they use data like experts. They know how their students are performing and in a really positive way, they share it with their students, especially struggling students. They use the data to motivate their students to show them they are making growth. They work together with them to make short, measurable goals. And depending on the grade, students might chart their data as well. It gives them ownership over their learning. It makes them excited when they grow. It helps them strive to achieve. And when you're talking about students who are coming from trauma, from poverty, who are not intrinsically motivated, you wouldn't believe how something like this can totally change their perspective. Because they see the growth. They're encouraged by it, just like we are when we see growth in our data. And it also gives students something to shoot for. And they want to get better. And it has nothing to do with becoming average or hitting a certain mark across the whole class. It's very individual and private. Um, strategy nine, again, remembering to look at both growth and proficiency when reviewing your students' data. This happens sometimes to us still. We see a student start to take off in the fall. By winter, they're doing well. If we back off, what happens? Taking our foot off the gas, as Heidi would say, right? Got to keep your foot on the gas to keep seeing those gaps get smaller and smaller. And this seems like super obvious, but it's really the hardest. Because when the data isn't good, right, it's easy to say it's the fault of someone or something else. But the key is, when data doesn't look good, when students' performance doesn't look good, the only thing we can fix is instruction. And that might be keeping instruction the same, but modifying it in some way, or adding in something else. Sometimes the data says, nope, a whole nother strategy is necessary. Sometimes, as Kelly always reminds us, it's repetition. Those students who struggle might need 100 repetitions versus 10 for another student. But that's why progress monitoring the right skills is so important. I gave you some data pitfalls to avoid. These are just things we've done here and learned from, things I've gone through time and time again. And this is on your knowledge sheet too. But you can't do it all. That's the key. You're super busy. 
And the more data tasks you can share with your team, the better. You can't rely on one person to do it all. And you can't rely on a single data source to give you all the information. Um, it's also on the other end important not to get bogged down with too much data and too many reports and looking at all sorts of other things when the answer is very simple. It's oral reading fluency, right? Um, it's really hard, but you know, mid-year, especially like February and March, we all get really discouraged and we really get bogged down with all of the things outside of our control. Our students who are homeless, our students with terrible backgrounds, um, students who just came here from another country and speak zero English and, and they're scared and we're struggling to help them. It's easy to kind of get bogged down with all of that. But looking at our data and where we've come from can be really encouraging and show us we are on the right track. We just have to keep at it. And sometimes that's the hardest thing too, sticking with it. Um, being as organized as possible is super helpful, especially like how I said now is the perfect time. So even spending like an hour a week over the summer getting organized and getting some templates in place will save you so much time in the fall. Um, also though, remember progress monitoring is not the intervention and we have fallen into that trap too. Progress monitoring, progress monitoring, progress monitoring, and you know, we're wondering why the kids like aren't even trying anymore. Um, that's not the intervention. It's just a tool to see if your intervention's on the right track. Um, only looking at a student's data at one point in time without a historical context. And then only focusing on that one benchmark assessment. Um, never comparing your student's data to national norms in some sort of norm reference system is another pitfall. And backing off from what is working when suddenly start, things start to turn around a little bit. Okay, so which camp are you in? Either. I already do all of this. This is a total waste of an evening, but I got a good taco. Or, this sounds like a whole lot of work, or maybe somewhere in between. So, the notorious RBG, who we love. We remember her quote, real change, enduring change happens one step at a time. And even if you can only do one thing, make one change with using data. When you see the payoff, it's just really reinforcing. And either way, like it or not, data is an ongoing educational issue and ongoing national issue. So my final words of wisdom, it can be used for good or evil like anything, right? Data is like any other tool. And sometimes the direction it points us in is obvious, but we set up a lot of imaginary barriers as to why we don't need to look at it or why we don't have time to look at it. Um, but try to step out of your comfort zone and have honest and open conversation with others and yourself about it. And remember our golden rules and care team. That's why I have them. Data can be really threatening. Um, but if you get over that initial hesitation, um, it can become your best tool, maybe friend. So, I told you in the beginning that it would come to some point. Hopefully it did. Why I started from the beginning with my background, um, this crazy journey I'm on 
this crazy job that I never thought I would ever have. Not in the plans. I even hated math, you know? Um, somehow I've ended up here um, in this wonderful, amazing little community in this beautiful little school um, with wonderful people that I just adore and love working with. And the great thing about being a data coordinator in a one building district is I see the little faces behind the data all the time. And when someone's marching off to Kim or Katie's office, I'm like, I know your data. What did you do? You know? <laughs> um, so it's really meaningful to me. That's um, what I really want to highlight, that data here at Lincor, we know the little faces behind it, and that's why we use data. That's why it's really important to us, because the bottom line is our job is to help kids grow, and most importantly, to help them learn to read, to give them a shot in life like I had, because somehow, thank God, I became a really great reader, and that's what saved me. And that's kind of what drives me every day um, when I see kids with similar backgrounds to mine. And it makes me um, so happy when we finally have it all figured out and we see kids making all of these gains and all this progress and we celebrate together. Um, that's what it's all about. It's not just about numbers and spreadsheets for us here. It's much more meaningful than that. Um, and so that wraps up my presentation. Um, I am open to any questions you have, and thank you very much.